Hello and welcome to History 342. We're back. Welcome back. We're back from spring break. And uh, here we go with online learning. Like I said in the previous video, expect some video content like this, uh, supplemented by Zoom in in-person sessions, I guess. And of course, stick with the reading. Um, well, over the course of the spring break, I'll be honest, I've encountered a bunch of challenges. Um, it has been difficult. My my initial idea was that I'd make kind of three or four videos per 90 minute session. They'd all be like five or six minutes. I'd be super entertaining, which is probably wishful thinking on my part, and I could really make them kind of accessible and digestible and everything else. Well, um, yeah, uh, you know, my kids need a lot of attention right now. Um, I need some attention. I don't know about you, uh, but this whole global crisis thing is kind of hard. All I can say is that um, this is, I keep saying it, but I think it's worth keep say, it's worth it to keep saying it. This is a weird situation and I am happy to talk to you about any kind of concerns you're having or worries you're having or problems you're having. So let's talk about today's topic, which is effectively kind of Japan in the first half of the interwar period from the 1912-1913 Taisho crisis up until kind of Great Depression slash early 19. 30s. What's happening in Japan? Well, we kind of jumped ahead in class a few weeks ago and started looking at Japan, the empire, in particular Japan as the invader of mainland China. And now we're back looking at what's happening domestically in Japan and, and what is the situation. You know, sometimes Japan is kind of considered a little bit of not a liberal paradise per se, but certainly a more liberal period than the militarism that follows. And the 1920s is kind of seen as almost this kind of, you know, swinging kind of period, I suppose, to a certain extent. But like, what's actually going on? Well, there's kind of four main things I want to talk about uh, in this particular video. There's the boom and bust of World War One. There's the change in the social composition. Um, uh, and the change of social classes in Japan, cultural reactions to that social change, and then finally I'll talk about the Great Depression of 1929. So World War One boom and bust. Well, World War One in many ways was kind of a very positive thing for the Japanese government, certainly following on the kind of industrial and military goals of the 1870s and 1880s. Industrial output increased from over a billion yen to over six billion yen. Uh, per year. In many ways, World War I offered a chance for Japanese industrial capacity to kind of show itself off to the Western world and to kind of, you know, you know, further establish Japan's credentials as a true, you know, great power, capital G, capital P. In addition to that, the First World War had relatively few costs for the Japanese, at least in terms of kind of direct military cost and things like that. If anything, World War I was typically characterized by opportunism on the part of the Japanese. The Japanese government does a very good job of acquiring various territories and permissions and all kinds of advantages that the Germans had secured in the decades leading up to World War I in China. The Japanese go into China and successfully get all these kinds of factory rights and all these unequal treaty benefits that the Germans had negotiated for in the decades leading up to the war. In fact, the Japanese get quite aggressive towards China, famously in 1915 making the quote-unquote 21 demands that in the end are kind of retracted because they're so extreme once they're made known to the Chinese public, you have massive demonstrations across China uh, that kind of bleeds into uh, demonstrations against Versailles and everything else a couple of years later. China at this point is a bit of a non-entity, at least geopolitically speaking. They had a revolution in 1911 and their political situation is chaotic. Japan is not the only external country taking advantage of China, which really is something going on for many decades before that. So remember, Korea is a Japanese colony. Japan is the de facto number one power in the region at this particular time. World War I is also seeing effectively a realization of kind of the industrialization plus imperial dream of Japanese reach. Certainly that industrial productivity is unmatched across the region, but there are problems as well. The price of rice almost doubles over the course of World War One, And you're starting to see a very serious stratification of classes between kind of, you know, regular Japanese and very, very wealthy Japanese. In addition to there being economic and logistical shifts from a culture that, for example, prioritized the samurai and legislated those privileges in code of law and everything else and looked down upon profit, you now have this movement by the end of the 1910s towards a culture where being rich, if not perhaps glorious just yet, is certainly recognized and acceptable and everything else. And you're starting to see a bit of bitterness creep in, especially among the kind of working and lower middle classes of Japan, you know, which now exist. This hadn't been a thing uh, 60 years earlier, right? You were kind of born into the class that you were born into and you kind of went from there. And the truth of the matter is the samurai were far more stratified than perhaps kind of, you know, the popular culture and even the law recognized but again that wasn't really talked about or experienced or worried about to the extent that it now will be it towards the end of the late 1910s and going into the 1920s where there's this deep frustration there is now an elite 
very, very wealthy class of people who effectively, particularly if you're of a Marxist persuasion, and Japanese communism will become a pretty major thing in the 1920s and 1930s, that are, that are benefiting at your expense, you being the regular Japanese person in this case. This is one of the ways in which social dynamics are changing pretty dramatically. You have an increasingly small and dramatically powerful, very wealthy class, whether they're controlling industry in the cities or owning all the land in the countryside. You have large amounts of Japanese who are perhaps tenant farmers or who work in factories or in shops. Now, there are lots of kind of self-employed Japanese. The city of Tokyo, for example, has a large number of shopkeepers and self-employed people like that. But you have, and you have a kind of a stratification between types of middle class people, the kind of old middle class people, uh, the old style middle class people who basically, you know, own their own shops and petty manufacturers and things like that, versus the quote unquote new middle class who exist because of new government ideas like bureaucracy and public school teaching and all these kinds of things. So you have all this kind of differentiation in Japanese society, and Japanese society had had differentiation before. In fact, it had worse differentiation, really, but it wasn't something that um, w was necessarily as potent in terms of causing problems. You know, the language of Japanese government now, as fitting an Enlightenment society, is one that talks about equality and everything else. So this is creating kind of, you know, real problems. Um, in addition, you have a change. You now people are organizing and associating with each other. You have protests for, uh, the, for suffrage, both male and female suffrage, in the late 1910s that get quite vigorous. You have the formation of unions, such as the Greater Federation for Japanese Labor in 1919. Um, but you have problems from that as well. So gender is a big part of this. Women are now in public in a way they hadn't been before. Only a couple of decades earlier, um, you know, it was pretty typical to see well-to-do Japanese men walking around a Japanese city in Western-style clothing while their wife walked behind them still wearing her kimono or something else like this. Well, kimono, first of all, that was kind of a very privileged kind of view anyway of kind of a wealthy Japanese couple. But kimono and other types of traditional dress were not typically useful for, you know, working in a factory, for example, which lots of women Women were now doing and they weren't just working in factories they're working in office buildings and they're working in coffee shops and things like this so they're they're visible in a way they haven't been before throughout the 1920s it becomes more common for women to attend political gatherings in fact outright bans that have been instituted are lifted in 1922 so women are now kind of more a part of the conversation and more part of this new kind of society and as Japan's going to the 1920s it is a new kind of a society a society dominated in many ways by a type of consumerism certain aspects of what we would now see popular culture. Japan is kind of participating in, um, you know, these larger changes we see throughout the world in the 1920s. You have the rise of department stores, like the Mitsukoshi department store, for example, and other department stores. You can go and you can buy things and buy goods. And while you're in there, you know, if you're getting perfume, perhaps there's a woman with lots of makeup on and a nice hat and everything and all these kind of, uh, kind of a, a retail uniform type thing, who's there to greet you and be nice to you. And this is all you know, for young Japanese, it's kind of, eh, whatever. For older Japanese, it's a titillating behavior. What's going on? You know, there's famous cases of, you know, women being suspected, particularly by older conservative Japanese, of being lascivious in some way, of using their bodies to get ahead, of taking advantage of men, of taking advantage of these new, loose standards in society to do terrible, terrible things. And a lot of that, pretty much all of it, is massively overwrought. There's this fear over women with short hair, like, you know, shoulder-length hair, and wearing skirts that expose their ankles and all these wild crazy things that will surely topple society um, off the abyss and into nowhere. The best example of this is the modern girl, Modangaru, um, who she's this phenomenon, uh, you know, she shows up in newspapers and magazines all the time, she's talked about all the time, um, and she's kind of idolized by one section of Japanese society, or at least kind of, you know, uh, sent out to people as this is how you are a young woman in this new world. But for other groups who have various reasons to be frustrated with Japanese society, she's a sign of everything that's wrong. And there's a lot of um, assumptions here about uh, undue Western influence in popular culture, the arrival of cinema, for example. Um, communism is becoming more and more popular in Japanese society in the 1920s, and certainly for an older conservative Japanese man, this is all, it's all one of a oneness, right? There's all very scary stuff, and the sign that, you know, there, there's a kind of a lingering sense that, um, you know, there can be morally widespread problems in Japanese society explained by these kinds of symptoms. Um, while saying all of that, Japan has at the same time developed a fairly consistent or, or a quickly growing, you know, consumerist kind of uh, culture. Um, and, and with that, you see lots of interactions between Japan and the Western world. So an example of this, yet again, is baseball, where you see lots and lots of uh, 
Japanese baseball teams traveling over to the United States to do tours and occasionally American teams coming over the other side. The most famous of this by far is the 1934 All-Star team because it featured one particular uh, Babe Ruth and the Babe was fated all over Japan. He was treated like the second coming. Massive crowd up to see Babe Ruth and he, he delivered and there's a very famous picture of him with a parasol standing at first base and just of him just being an extremely charming uh, friendly man. But that 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 was a little bit of an aberration at that point because already by 1934, Japan's relationship with the West had kind of been souring in many ways because of the invasion of Manchuria and the establishment of Manchukuo, uh, but also, of course, Japan is changing. And a big factor in this was the Great Depression. The problem with the Great Depression of 1929 in many ways is that it exacerbates existing problems in Japanese society that have been brewing for at least a decade. So, for example, you take the modangaru, you take the modern girl, and all these assumptions and fears of her being sexually active and everything else. Well, there were also sex work um, type places in Japan uh, that were supposedly, you know, tea shops or coffee shops or the like, where the waitress wasn't technically a prostitute, but you would, you know, the customer would negotiate with her and go and, and use those services some other way afterwards. And this was kind of a right, this was an emerging thing in Japanese urban life. It wasn't being regulated very well. And particularly for conservative Japanese who kind of saw all the women with the Western style haircuts and, and, and short skirts, or at least short skirts for the time, as being these, you know, denizens of sex and danger and everything else. Now they're looking at a situation where, oh my God, this is actually really bad. And the extent to which we're allowing prostitution to kind of slowly creep into, uh, and to become a norm in our society we don't want it to become in the sense that, you know, there's some, perhaps, people we, we wouldn't mind becoming prostitutes, but we don't want all the girls of the nation to become prostitutes. And, of course, the hardship after the Great Depression uh, is theoretically, and, and in fairness was, driving more people into these kind of situations that otherwise wouldn't have. The other element was this kind of moneyed class, this privileged class. Well, they were real, and especially in the months after the Great Depression, some of these people, by speculating on the gold standard, made a lot of money and did very, very well just as everybody else was doing very, very badly. And this has a massively negative impact on public confidence in general, on this kind of industrial leadership capitalist class. And this capitalist class and the government had very, very close ties. Remember that whole Zaibatsu arrangement? That hasn't gone anywhere. This notion that government and capitalist leadership should be working together was kind of a core concept, really, of the Meiji modernization and the kind of moving forward in capitalist development. Well, now the government has a problem in that the government is already carrying the can for perceived problems in terms of, you know, the moral character of the nation and everything else. But now you see these capitalist leaders acting immorally as well. And it's not just morals, they're acting in ways that are hurting other Japanese. They're profiting while other Japanese are losing their homes, are struggling to make enough money to eat. This is a big problem. And this is the situation that's going into the 1930s where you had this kind of liberal Taisho period, 1920s Japan, that perhaps we make a little bit too much of, but at the same time, let's stay one dimensional for just a second, Japan's on this trajectory to go along a certain kind of road of Western style or Western influence development. And the Great Depression kind of hits a real bump in that and exacerbates existing problems and delegitimizes that pathway in a way that can be very problematic for Japan going forward. So the discussion question for today is, the Great Depression effectively leads indirectly to the rise of military government in the 1930s. And we'll talk about that more in a couple of days. But why did the changing social relations and social mixes in 1910s and 1920s Japan leave Japanese society vulnerable to the potential rise of a military government? Okay, thanks for watching.